The reason why I'm interviewing Benjamin Fulford today, which in my time here in Los Angeles, California, would be November 28th, 2011, a Monday. For Ben, it's already Tuesday. The reason why we're doing this interview is that Ben has been talking for a very long time now about a counterinsurgency against what I lovingly call the old world order, which is a melange of international characters that started out with an Asian secret society. For those of you who don't already know, I'd like to establish some of his bona fides so it doesn't sound like he's tooting his own horn here. But Ben was the Asia Pacific Bureau Chief for Forbes magazine. He has a long history of professional credentialed academic journalism. And as you can find out from many other interviews that he's done, some of which are on my site, he got involved into a world of intrigue when he started to trace where the money was going from the Japanese economy. He realized the economic stimulus that could be generated to the world was not being used for anything that was positive, and it seemed like a lot of money was disappearing. And that investigative trail actually led to him getting death threats and getting drawn into an Asian secret society as a counterbalance against the old world order guys who also tried to silence him and bribe him by offering him, I forget, Ben, was it an ambassadorship they wanted to give you or something like that? Well, they offered me at one point the job of finance minister of finance Japan. Finance minister of Japan, right. They also, believe it or not, offered me uh, General Electric and General Motors. Really? Well, yeah. Like you would be the CEO or something? Yeah, and I guess I'm a chief shareholder. Chief, um, okay. The problem, of course, is I had to go along with their plan to kill four billion people. It's a classic sell your soul to the devil situation. Right, they just need to lighten the load and get rid of some surplus. That's how they like to talk about it. Well, they, they want to save the environment and get rid of the useless eaters, you yeah? know? Exactly. So, look, man, I, I've been on the Internet since uh, 1996. I've had my own public presence since 1998. And I watched you ever since you came out. And I noticed right off the bat, I believe you emerged in like 2007. Was that correct? Something like that? Yeah, it must have been around that time. Yeah. That, because you, I'd been researching a lot of stuff before then, but I didn't feel it was safe to go out in public because I knew they would kill me. Yeah. And it wasn't until I got protection that I was able to come out and start saying this stuff. Right, and it is true that within Japan, you are a best-selling author. You've sold, uh, how many books do you have in print, and how many units have you sold? I don't know, more than 30 books, and I don't know, more than maybe a million and all. Uh, wow, I haven't okay. kept track. But that's, that's, so 30 titles is very substantial. Um, you are fully bilingual, nobody can challenge that because there's plenty of videos they can watch of you talking fluently in Japanese. I have seen endless iterations of every type of hate comment that somebody would lob at you. And the most frequent one is that they just can't wrap their head around the story. They think that it's too implausible that these Asian secret societies would contact you. But I see that because you're bilingual and because you are a credible financial journalist, who then became a best-selling author and quite renowned for these, as you're saying, 30 books that you have in Japan. There's no other gaijing, or what they that's the word they use for foreigner. There's no other gaijing in Japan. There's no other white guy out there that I'm aware of who's doing what you've done. So who else would they have chosen for something like this well, to try to okay. bridge over to the Western world? Sure, look, what, what you have to realize is that... Um there's a couple of reasons why I fell into this particular niche. One is that um, I wrote a lot of stuff that if I had been a Japanese journalist, I would have been killed for. Oh, really? But because like I was a foreigner working for a, a visible magazine like Forbes, uh, you know, I was off limits. And... This is stuff that would have rattled the chains of the government or stuff that would have insulted the emperor? What are we talking here? I'm talking, in, in essence, I'm talking about the, the secret colonial government here. In other words, right. um, they've been using a network of North Koreans and gangsters and, and bribed the Japanese. And they've been using bribery and murder to, to make this 
country a colony that only uh, is an independent country on the surface. Now, I want to get back to that, but briefly... Okay, but uh, let me, okay, let me just ahead, tell you go how Sorry. I got involved yeah. in, in a really short summary. I yeah. Basically, I started writing books in Japanese, and... And this was what I, year, approximately? I guess uh, the, the ones that really caused troubles came out around 2006, and uh, basically saying, you know, the 911 stuff that was uncovered by many researchers in the West. So this was before you ever appeared on Rents or anything in the West? Yeah. Okay. And then I had a book out in Japanese that pointed out that uh, SARS was a bioweapon that was designed to kill non-Caucasian people. For those who don't remember, SARS is the bird flu. It's a... Well, there's... there's I mean, basically... I. I quoted from the documents written by the neocons, like the Project for a New American Century and stuff, pointing out very clearly that there was a group of Western elitists who were planning to start World War III and were trying, planning to reduce the world population, and that we, the Asians could stop this by cutting off their money, because they required Japanese and Chinese money to finance this insane project. And... An order came out in the Japanese underworld to have me killed, okay? And the South Korean... That's understandable if you start sure, putting your the finger South in... The South Korean secret police then told the Chinese, and the Chinese sent a secret society to offer me protection. And that's how I became involved in a world I never even knew existed until that time. I mean, if you'd talked to me before that about Freemasons and stuff, you would have got a nervous giggle and, and a shrug, and that's about it, you know? Right, it's, uh, a, it's, a, it's a funny handshake, and they give money to charity, and da 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 You know, but right. what... But the other thing is, of course, the Chinese themselves had eavesdropped, you know, one of the conferences at the Bohemian Grove, and they were fully aware of this plan to, you know, reduce the world population and start World War III, and we're trying to stop it. And and when they realized that they were I was being put on a hit list for, for trying to warn them of something they already knew about, that's how I got involved. <clears throat> okay, one thing, as I'm talking to you, I'm also uh, responding to the fact that when we've published articles in the past, we get two or three hundred written comments on them, and I'm able to read what everybody says and the feedback that they have. And so I'm trying to speak not just for myself, but also for the collective. Now, one of the stumbling blocks that I think we've had in other interviews that people don't get clear on is when you say the Chinese, people naturally think of this repressive government that's like burning people's houses down in Tibet, is restricting YouTube and restricting freedom and won't let people march on Tiananmen Square and is basically just this human rights crushing monster. Um, okay, I guess I, I made a mistake when I said Chinese. Okay. I should have said Asia, okay, because this transcends China. It, it involves uh, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, uh, Japan, Taiwan, Korea. It, it's a pan... In fact, it, it goes right to the uh, group of non-aligned nations. It's a 77-nation group that included places like Yugoslavia. Uh, so it, it was wrong of me to call it the Chinese. It's an Asian secret society, okay. not a Chinese secret society. What would be the relationship between this Asian secret society and the current communist government of China? Believe it or not, the old royal families of Asia uh, decided that communism would be the best way to modernize China. Okay. So that behind and above the communist government in China and the mainland, uh, the uh, the uh, government in Taiwan, you'll find an old group of families that whose connections go way beyond beyond temporary political structures. Uh, now, this correct, is some me, correct me if I'm wrong, but China is named after Emperor Qin, who was of the Dragon family, and that was the first dynasty of China, right? Yeah. And so these people, he's the one that built the terracotta soldiers where he took every soldier and every horse in his army and built a stone sculpture out of them. And there's all sorts of uh, 
interesting facts about how this dragon family showed up and that they basically kind of erased all the history from China before then, which is now being rebuilt by certain scholars. But that basically, these Asian secret societies appear to be dynastic. They've largely been behind the scenes. They've amassed large amounts of wealth. And that's part okay. of what we're into now, right? That's what we're talking about. Is I, you got to remember that there are, there's not a single, there are several different competing groups. But essentially, you have a similar thing both in Asia and, and in the West. You have secret societies that are connected to ancient dynastic bloodlines, okay? Okay. In, in the West, that would be the Rothschilds and the British royal families and the Freemasons and the P2 Lodge, okay? In right. Asia, it would be uh, the dragon families, I would guess. Uh, and this would be all the various dynastic uh, families and clan groupings uh, based on, you know, uh, family ties. But in the West, you had a different group that, uh, and it's confusing because there's several groups that call themselves Illuminati, but there's a group that has contacted me uh and they've proven to me they're connected to various agencies as well as international drug smuggling rings, okay? Okay. But uh, they claim they started the uh, French, American, and Russian revolutions and that they are opposed to uh, bloodline rule. And in the same way, the Asians have a secret society that's also based on meritocracy and they are also opposed to bloodline rule and this would be... Uh, a group that, I mean, the, the Chinese triads and the Japanese Yakuza groups and, and these various other uh, secret groups in Asia have strict rules against nepotism. So the, the son of a gang boss could never take over his father's gang. Mm. Uh, and and uh, these are linked to martial arts societies and uh, also chambers of commerce. There's no clear line between like a, a an official chamber of commerce and outlaw gangsters being chased by the uh, police. It's a it's a it's a gray zone, uh, with okay. light gray and dark gray. You know. Okay, uh, I want. So what I'm saying is that you have both in the West and in the East. You have meritocratic secret societies mm -hmm. and bloodline secret societies. Right. Okay. Um, and could you just briefly enunciate for us? I mean. A lot of people have PTSD around hearing about things like Illuminati, and as soon as you say stuff like that, the paranoia kicks in, the fear and the anxiety kicks in. So when you say that these are dynastic bloodline families in Asia, that these are secret societies, are they sacrificing babies? Are they drinking people's blood? Are they doing satanic rituals? I mean, what are we talking about here in terms of who are these people? What do they think? What's their philosophy? What do they want? Do they want to take over the planet? Are they fighting against the Illuminati to control the planet? What's their agenda? Um, well, they think that uh, the the center or the, the the control of the future of the of the planet should no longer be controlled by a small Western elite, and they would rather have it fall under the control of the people of the planet. Um, now, there is a group, of course, of, of chauvinistic people who say China should rule the world in China. Uh, but the general consensus in Asia as a whole is that it should be equal for all the people of the planet and not just a, either a Chinese or a Kazarian controlled, you know, family business that runs the planet. Sure. So when you're talking so about... They, what they say yeah. publicly, I think, is, is really what they expect for now, which is a multipolar world, not one controlled by a single group. Okay, another question which I think might help to allay the skeptics, because there's a lot of them, and they're very nasty, uh, is could there be the possibility of a single point failure in what you're telling us? In other words, is it possible that all of the stuff that you just told me about these Chinese secret societies is the result of you meeting one or two guys and them telling you these elaborate stories and you call the guy on the phone every other day and he gives you new information, but that's yeah, it. Uh, listen, I was a journalist. I've been a journalist here for more than 25 years. I've met 
most of the post-war prime ministers in Japan. I've met wow. finance ministers, the heads of most of the large corporations in Asia. Remember, I was the Asia Pacific bureau chief for the world's largest business magazine. Well, what does that really mean? I mean, how do you get to meet a prime minister? Why I would, would they talk to, to you? I would go to Taiwan, I'd go to China, I'd go to Russia, I'd go to Vietnam, I'd go to Australia, and I'd meet the heads of large corporations uh, who want to publicize their companies. Well, what I'm trying to say is that were you selling I've advertisements? Met hundreds of people, but also just okay. more recently, since quitting that job, um, I've literally my sources run into the hundreds, um, and I know the bosses of the triads, the yakuza gangs. Uh, I know the heads of the the, the Japanese um, military intelligence and the police forces here. I, I know the heads of the martial arts societies. Um, I've talked to top, you know, the Politburo members in China. Uh, so no, it's not me talking to one handler or two handlers feeding me disinformation. However, uh, it's true that they've thrown all sorts of disinformation my way to try to, you know, ruin my credibility. But at the end of the day, and this is what people need to realize, is that uh, I don't really need to prove this uh, to the public at large because. We're trying to convince right now the heads of the Pentagon, the CIA, the NSA, the KGB, the Freemasons. In other words, we're trying to convince the people who control the, the military industrial complex and the politicians that this is a better plan than what's in place now. Um, and I'm sorry, but a, a lot of people out there have been so brainwashed at, by television that all you have to do is change what's on the TV to change their minds, you know? Sure. Um, but I have provided tape recordings and photographs and videos and various proofs to assorted police and investigative agencies. So, you know... Uh, I don't really need to prove myself uh, at this point, uh, although if there's a legitimate criticism, I'm happy to answer it. Oh, I understand that. Uh, one question that I'd like to edify here, when we see videos of you in Japan, there's been on at least three videos I'm aware of, you're appearing with a man who seems to have, he's carrying a walking stick and he has kind of a raspy voice. Um. So who is this guy, and what's okay, his connection? Most people don't speak Japanese. They have no idea yeah, what's okay, going his on. His name is Chodoin Daikaku, okay? Okay. And he controls the world's martial arts societies. So he's the head of the karate associations, the Aikido associations. Um, now, there's a couple like the judo and the uh, Chinese martial arts that they don't act. He's not the head of them, but he knows the guys who run them. Uh, so... He's a he's a he's a big wig, you know. He's not a he's not just some flake. Okay. Um, when you say he controls the karate association, well, he's the how head many... of the organizations. Okay. So so how many schools and how many people are we talking about that he that would be like that he'd be I working think with? There are like fifty million people worldwide studying Japanese martial arts. You know, they have uh, karate schools in Mexico and Iran and you know wherever. Sure, sure, but we're I talking mean, very big organizations. But here. couldn't couldn't anybody just open a karate school without accreditation? Or are you saying there is an accreditation and that he's at the head of that accrediting agency? Well, if they opened a karate school, they probably got a black belt or something. Okay, and they did that by going to some teacher affiliated with our organization. I see. So there is some sort of centralized authority that you have to appeal to if you want to run a karate school. <clears throat> well, if you want to get a, a a belt, you have to study, you know, at one of these accredited schools. Yeah, I see. You, so, you know, um, so nobody could just hang out a sign and say, "Here's a karate school. Here's your black belt," and have you be taken seriously if you wanted to go to a martial arts tournament and actually compete. Well, I mean, if you know, it's a meritocracy. So if you just you know put on a black belt and go to these tournaments and beat people's ass, they'll recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But within Japan, maybe in particular, let's say, this guy that you were referring to, Chodoin Daikaku, Daikaku. Mm -hmm. um, 
he is sort of like the kingpin of martial arts groups in Japan. Uh, yeah, I made your kingpin. Let's put it that way. Now, and, and would he's you also s- connected to the uh, Japanese self defense forces? But what you need to realize is that most of the guys I talk to uh, don't want their name or picture out there at all. Sure, absolutely. They refuse to let me name them or put out their photographs. But I have introduced them to MI6 CIA types, um, and they, at that level, they do communicate. Okay. I know that it's it's hard to pin you down time wise. Could you paint for the average listener what your day is like? I mean, how many insiders, how many different people do you think you talk to in a given week, right now? Um, it really depends, but basically. What happens now is I talk to people who are connected to large organizations. Okay. okay. So um, I have one guy I talk to who I know has uh, strong Pentagon CIA connections. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then there's another guy I talk to who's definitely Rothschild MI6 connected British royal family type. Okay. Okay. And I've confirmed independently, these people that, uh, you know, through multiple sources that they're real, okay? Sure. And then there's another guy who uh, I talked to who would be uh, connected to the Japanese right-wing groups as well as the uh, Asian secret societies. Hmm. And then there's this Chodoin uh, guy uh, I talked to. And then less often, for example, I talked to... Uh, senior people, the Japanese gangs, like the Yamaguchi Gumi or the Inagawa Kai or the Sumiyoshi. Um, and there's a guy I talked to who's a KGB uh, Serbian intelligence type I talk to quite regularly. Hmm. Um, from you know, Russia or from Serbia? He's from, well, I, I originally you... from Serbia. Okay? okay, I should say more than that. Right. I don't want to betray your sources at all. So, yeah. But, but for example, I know I've gone out drinking with the wife of Prime Minister Khan Nalto many times. She lives in my neighborhood. Wow. Uh, there's a lot of people I know. So, um, and uh, there has been, though, and I'll mention this, there's, there's been a very, very intensive campaign to make me seem like a flake. Sure. Um, and they have a book about as thick as a phone book a file on me uh, and they first of all they tried to kill me and then they when they realized that there was protection behind me and that would mean they would whoever ordered the kill would be killed themselves in retaliation the next they tried to drive me into bankruptcy by by blacklisting me um, and that when that didn't work well hold uh, on what do you mean blacklist okay I used to have regular TV shows in Japan and I had oh you did uh, Oh yeah, I'm a, a big prime time shows, and and uh, I was able like to on publish, NHK or what network? Uh, NHK had a twenty minute special on me. I've been prime time. Uh, I wow. had various networks, but but the point is, I was also able to publish stories in places that um, major Western media. But you know, I got put on a blacklist. Um, what around what time was that? What year? That would happen, I guess, it started around 2005, 2000, 2006, after I left Forbes and started writing stuff about 911. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that would be about it. So 911 was your first major book that you put out? Was that, 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 that was, was your was first book? Magazine as magazine articles. And then I was holding press conference at the, at the Foreign Correspondence Club explaining why I was writing about 911. You know, just trying to get publicity in the Western media, hmm. and that's when I realized that either they were scared of losing their jobs, or they were working for some agency and only pretending to be a journalist, um, and that the media was controlled. I mean, I already knew it was controlled, but I didn't know how thoroughly controlled it was until I had press conferences about nine one one and presented the evidence. And uh, well, now, had people like the New York Times correspondent telling me you know, that he would be fired if he wrote about this, you know. So your opinion about 9-11 is obviously not Arabs with box cutters. What, could you synopsize what, you, what was your conclusion that got you in so much trouble? You're obviously not supporting the official 
dogma around 9-11? Um, well, I think the, the short story is that it's that slogan. It was an inside job. The problem, yeah. you know, the evidence is overwhelming, you know, that it wasn't uh, done by a small group of uh, Saudi terrorists with box cutters. But the problem that most people encounter is that uh, if it wasn't, then the implications are so mind-boggling because it involved such a large amount of people and so much planning and so many insiders that people go into a state of denial. Such a conspiracy was too large to be possible. Um, and, and they, they just, their minds shut it off. Well, I also, uh, my major in college was psychology, and I went through a suicide hotline internship, so I have the equivalent of master's just from education. And we learned, in, especially in crisis counseling, we learned about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. And what it turns out is that when somebody's been traumatized heavily, they create a dissociative partition in their mind. It's like a separate personality that handles the trauma. Yeah. And they get very defensive. And, and typically, if you tell them information that brings up that PTSD, that triggers their trauma, <clears throat> they will attack the messenger because the trauma is so severe that they will do anything not to sure. actually re-experience it. In any case, if you go back to the history, you realize that you know, if you, if you that they've always had to create fake incidents in, in order to get people fired up into war. This is, you know, uh, you go back to historical cases and people don't have that trauma associated with it. For example, um, if you look at why the Spanish American War started, you'll realize it was a fake incident. You know, the blowing up the ship, the Maine, right, uh, and blaming it on Spain. You know, nice headline rhyme there, eh? Yeah. Um, uh, and then seven years later, they say, actually, we blew it up ourselves, you know? Right. Uh, well, if you were at the time saying it was done by the Americans, they would have lynched you on the street, you know? You um, mentioned a mind-blowing piece of information about the Titanic. Yeah, I mean, that was... Uh, remember, the, a book came out a year before about a ship called the Titan that sank on its maiden voyage, you know? And, uh, right. They, they got rid of, in one fell swoop, about 600 industrialists who were opposed to the taking over the Fed, you know, um, and J.P. Morgan was saying, hey, let's all talk about it while we cross the Atlantic, and of course, he missed the ship at the last moment, and they were prevented at gunpoint from boarding the lifeboats, you know, well, the there's, whole, a lot of, yeah. there's a lot of stuff that's going to come out, but uh, the conclusion I've reached, and, and it's really quite mind-boggling, is that, um, y you know, the story goes back to Sabatai Zev, a a self-described messiah of the Jews who lived in Turkey about 300 and some years ago. Mm -hmm. And he was, he said he was the messiah and that it was our, it was the job of the Jews themselves to carry out the uh, prophecies of the, uh, the Torah and that we shouldn't wait for God to do it. Mm. And the, the Sultan of Turkey had him called up and said, if, if you really are the messiah, then uh, you know, do some miracles, and if you can't, either you to convert to Islam, uh, or we'll execute you. And so he couldn't perform the miracles, so he, they pretended to uh, convert to Islam, and instead they they worked on subverting the Turkish government uh, from within, and that was the Young Turks eventually. But the Rothschild family did that become the Ottoman Empire, or is that something different? That was the, that was that was what undid the Ottoman Empire. Gotcha. That became okay. Ataturk. Ataturk was one of their members. Okay? okay, the founder of modern Turkey. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's hundreds of pages and, and documents and stuff to back up what I'm saying. I'm not just talking out of the side of my mouth here. Right. Um, right. But the point is that the Rothschilds like this idea, and so you had this this group, this about a million member sect. Uh, that believes the prophecies are inevitable, they can't be stopped, and they're actively working to carry them out. Mm. This is the, the really mind-boggling part of it, because um, it's just, you know, it, it's just too big and too ridiculous for most people to comprehend, but the evidence is overwhelming. And the point is that these prophecies call for, at the end of the, uh, they call for a huge battle between two great nations, Gog and Magog, Armageddon. 
Right. And that 90% of humanity would be killed in this battle, and then the remaining 10% would be enslaved by the Jews, who would each have 2,800 slaves. You remember, I've got Jewish ancestry on both sides, so I'm not... Well, this is not mainstream Jewish thinking. This is this particular sect, okay? Right. Which would be um, Sabbatean Jews? Yeah, Sabbateans, okay. I call them. Okay. I don't even call them Jews because their belief system isn't really Jewish. Right. Um, and uh, you had Israeli newspapers, okay, and they tried to set up this uh, war between the Soviet Union and the West, uh, which would have done that, and they, they almost succeeded during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, and I happened to be living in Cuba at the time, by the way. I was just a baby. Wow. And But what happened was then, and, and this is where we get into, you know, hard financial history, international financial treaties, uh, stuff that is very well documented in the archives. But um, basically a lot of the nations of the world said this is crazy. And they wanted something different. Um you know, I'm going to take you back a bit to, to so people can understand what's happening now and what what specific legal actions we're taking against this group of fanatics. Um, Please do, yeah. I've I've okay. read the entire 111 page document thoroughly, as if it was a contract I would be signing myself. So when we get right. to that, well, I'll be happy I, to dialogue with you. But go ahead, yeah, do it. I've been, I've you know, I I've been shown. Uh, many, many, many documents related to this um, that, you know, nothing to do with that lawsuit. But essentially, right. uh, in the 1930s, the Japanese invaded China. And their goal was to take the gold, the gold confiscate the Chinese gold. Uh, and were they still they was were, was Japan at that time trying to create what they called the Greater East Asian Co Prosperity Sphere? Or yes, that but Japan was also still linked to the the British. It's complica complex. Um, oh, but essentially, there was conflicting groups with conflicting goals. You got to remember that it's not a it's not a monolithic story. There's different actors with different agendas. Well, J <coughs> Japan the, was medieval up until 1877 when Captain Morgan, right, uh, stormed the Japanese shore with gunboats and basically said, westernize or die. And then Japan went into an extremely rapid, almost unprecedented industrial growth after that. Well, it was, um, it, it, that com it wasn't a Captain Morgan, but anyway, uh, the, the Rothschilds built up Japan as a military colony to use to dominate China. Okay. Beginning um, in the 1800s? Going right back. I mean, yeah. um, it, so as it, soon as uh, they westernized. Right, okay. Would, so uh, the Meiji the Meiji families, that was the Meiji Restoration where that all started. The Meijis were apparently kids, right? It was like a youth rebellion. Are you saying that the Rothschilds financed these youths and put them in power? They took over the southern clans of Satsuma and Choshu and then gave them more and weapons and used them to conquer Japan. Okay. Anyway, right, Japan that, that's was not feudal. Sidetrack. That, that's okay. an interesting uh, thing. But let's get to what's happening today. Okay, great. And we need to go back to the 1930s. The point was that Japan um, was invading China, and and they had these bandits run by a guy called Kodama Yoshio. They go into a town and they'd seize the gold and 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 loot the treasure. And then the Japanese army would show up and say, oh, we hear you've got bandit problems, we'll protect you. And by that time, the gold was all being shipped off to Tokyo, and then later to the Philippines. Very clever. Uh, and the, the, the Kuomintang government didn't want their gold to be taken by the Japanese. And in 1938, seven U.S. warships filled with Chinese gold and silver. And a lot of the gold was sent out before, too, going back to the 1920s. Uh, was sent to the United States, and the Chinese were given 60-year bonds. Let's um, let's just stick to the 1938 ones. They were given 60-year bonds in exchange for the gold they handed over to the Federal Reserve Board. Now, I just want to thread this. Are you saying that the Rothschilds, to some degree, were still behind these criminal actions of stealing the gold? There's the the American families behind the U.S. Federal Reserve Board who were trying to grab gold. 
and the Rothschilds were trying to grab gold. It was a gold grab with different people trying to grab gold for themselves and their groups, okay? So Japan, in some sense, was acting as a proxy for them. Yes. Okay. Uh, That's but the an point important is point, that yeah. A lot of gold was shipped to the United States, and the Chinese were given lots of U.S. government bonds with astronomical denominations in exchange for that gold. Now, you okay. mentioned that it was Kuomintang was the government. That would be the nationalist Chinese government that was in power in China at the time. Are those Chiang communists, or is this something else? No, no, this, they weren't communists. They're the people who then fled to Taiwan after the communists took over. Well, here's Taiwan, this little tiny country which has so much economic power. That's why China seems to always be trying to invade them and get it back. Are well, you saying that that's when this all started? Uh, I mean, the, the Taiwanese took a lot of the treasure with them when they fled China, yeah? Okay. They have a, a museum, the, the museum in, in Taiwan, which is very famous, and there's some hills behind the museum. And every year, they change the display in the museum, okay? They've been doing that for 50 years, and they haven't even begun to make a dent in displaying all the treasures they have hidden in those hills. My goodness. You're saying uh, these are subterranean vaults inside the hills? This is the ancient imperial treasure of China, okay? Wow. Um, but that's just one of the many treasure hoards that are out there. Where did the China get is, all this me, gold? Just, what? Are you saying, that, was this like from the Mongolians? Where did all the treasure come from in the first place? Did they conquer people it's, and get it that way, or what? Okay, well, for example, if you look at the old uh, st archives and, and history books, you'll see the Romans were buying silk and ceramics and spices from the Chinese and paying for it in gold. Oh, my God. And so were the Spaniards. when They, they took all the gold they stole from the Aztecs and the Inca Incas and they spent on, on Asian stuff. Okay? Oh, my God. So about 85% of the world's gold ended up in Asia over the past thousands of years. I'm really getting it now. This is amazing. Okay. Go ahead. And, and so part of the what World War II was about was a grab for this gold, all right? Wow. But um, Do they have anyway. military fortification around these hills in Taiwan? I mean, obviously, they would have to guard that very extensively if you're saying oh, there's sure. that much assets there. Yeah. Sure, and, and their, their big plan for when China invades is to scoot out the backside with all their gold. <laughs> 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 but anyway... Um, <clears throat> Getting back to the to so, the thread, uh, right? In, so the Kuomintang fled okay, China then, to Taiwan. All right, but what happened was the Western powers, the Western oligarchs, let's call them, their plan was to take all the gold out of private hands in the world. And you, what time frame are we in now? Nineteen thirty-eight. This, this is starting in the thirties. Remember, nineteen thirty-four, Roosevelt banned the private ownership of gold. Right, allegedly and, due to the Great Depression and the need yeah, to... And, yeah, and the Jews didn't want to give up their gold. That was one reason why they were rounded up and, and sent to concentration camps. Um, and the Asians didn't want to give up their gold. That's why they sent the Japanese army to come in and take it, you know? Um, I like it, okay. All right, so, so they wanted Because the Federal to Reserve wanted to... I mean, the basic idea was Roosevelt said, everybody who's... I mean, because some people may still not know this if they're that ignorant that the Federal Reserve confiscated everybody's gold. Even if you had it in a safe deposit box in the bank, they looted your safe deposit box and they took your gold away, correct? Yeah, they're doing that now, too. Really? Um, if you have gold in a safety deposit box and they haven't taken it yet, get it out. It's, it's ASAP. Wow. Where anyway, let's go back to the history. Okay. 1944, they had the Bretton Woods Agreement. And the at this agreement... The uh, a gold-backed international financial system was set up, and most of the gold that would not be con being controlled by the Western powers was removed from the market. Uh, How do you mean removed from the market? You mean it, it wasn't it was blacklisted and hidden in caves or buried in the uh, in sunken ships in the bottom of the ocean? <laughs> okay. Wow. Now, so you're um, saying that th that meant that that equity did not count towards whatever currencies were created worldwide. No, it was right. taken off market. They, this is a question of control. So, for example, the Thai royal family had lots and lots of gold, and, and they're not allowed to, to cash that, mm. uh, even to this day. The same with the uh, Persian gold, which is was shipped to Taiwan when the Shah of Iran fell, or shipped to Thailand when the Shah of Iran fell. But again, let's try to get to the thread. Let's try to stick to the plot here. Understood. We'll go back to this stuff later. So, 1944, Britain, France, and the United States were given a 50-year uh, 
uh, control over the global financial system. Okay, fifty-year mandate, I th- and they were supposed to develop and modernize the planet. However, the uh, Roosevelt, it turns out, was poisoned, killed. He didn't just die. Okay, mm-hmm. and th- there was a fascist coup. And the military-industrial complex guys basically wanted, instead of the development of the planet, they wanted this Cold War between the Soviet Union and the West, which was part of this GOG-MAGOG plan, you know? Right. And in 1955, the non-aligned nations, that's a 77-nation group, including China, Indonesia, uh, Yugoslavia, they all, India, you know, they all said, look, this is crazy. We don't want to be part of this Cold War. Uh, and they, they had the historical rights to most of the Asian treasure. Were most of uh, the Asian countries represented in the non-aligned nations? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, pretty well all of them. How about South America? South America, yeah, a lot of the countries that are there, like Brazil, were a part of the non-aligned nations. Okay, how about Africa? Well, Africa was still a proxy colony. Look, you'd have to go back okay. to the... The point is, there's 77 nations. I don't have the list in front okay, of me now. Okay, that's fine. But, but it included most of the people on the planet, just not the Soviet Union and North America, the European peoples, basically. Right. Uh, right. And they said that they wanted to finance a Marshall Plan for Asia and Africa to modernize these regions. This is and the this non-aligned were, nations that wanted this. Yeah, and okay. they pooled their treasure to finance this. But you said this is an and illicit this was, this, black market. There's an international treaty that people who, who doubt me can look up. It's called the Hilton Green Memorial, okay? Right, I've seen you talking about that. Yes, well, this was a treaty where they, where they wanted to finance a Marshall Plan for developing Asia and Africa and, and the rest of the world. And they, and they had as their asset base these blacklisted gold funds gold. that were in Thailand? Yes, and the signatory to all this money was President Sukarno of Indonesia, who happened to be related to most of the royal families, at least in Asia. Oh, so that's why and Indonesia was, then. It's because he had a blood connection to these folks. Yeah, and then they designated him as a signatory. Okay. okay? Um, and when the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis came and the world nearly went to all-out nuclear war, uh, a guy called Benjamin Friedman came out and basically admitted about these same, insane Gog Magog plans. And Kennedy and a lot of people in the U.S. said, all right, this is crazy. We don't want any more of the secret society craziness. And he agreed to work with the non-aligned nations to end the Cold War and to finance the development of Africa and Asia. And that to to keep the military industrial people happy, he was going to you know send a man to the moon and, and do that kind of stuff. And he so issued, Benjamin Friedman did he also blow the whistle on what was going on behind the Cuban Missile Crisis? Is that why you mentioned that? Well, he said, yeah, they're trying to they're trying to create this war on purpose so that they could take over the planet. Gotcha. Okay. Um, there's plenty of evidence for this, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, Kennedy got gold from Indonesia and he put out Kennedy bonds and, and notes, dollar bills that were controlled by the uh, U.S. Department of Treasury, not the privately owned Federal Reserve Board. And that was Executive <coughs> Order 11110, right? Yeah, I, uh, something yeah. like that. That's- but he was killed, okay? And then uh, Sukarno was driven from power and... By whom started- are you saying? Hmm? Who drove by, Sukarno? By the, by the West, by the military industrial complex. Okay. By the Cabal, I call them. The, because the people the, who own the Federal Reserve Board, these, these uh, Sabbatean sectists. But okay. couldn't, I mean, couldn't the Asian societies designate a new signatory to bring these blacklisted funds online and try to create a, uh, another currency that would compete with the dollar? Well, they didn't have the military power, okay? Basically. Oh. They, what they did is they went underground. They didn't sign over anything, okay? We have uh, Sukarno's nephew has signed over the the, the uh, rights to us now. But we'll get back to that. Okay. What happened was in 1968, they set up a fake heir, a fake signatory, uh, and 
day is the Asian societies? This would be Henry Kissinger. No, no, this would be Henry oh. Kissinger and the Rockefellers and all these people. The Bushes, the people behind the murder of Kennedy, the, the, the members okay. of the Sabatean cabal, okay? They set up a fake heir to what? Well, they, they, they forged the rights to, to uh, use that money as a basis for issuing currency. For creating dollars, they tried to. They tried to. In other words, they didn't have the historical rights to eighty-five percent of the world's gold that was owned by the Asians, but they faked the rights. They they forged documents to claim they had the rights. So they wanted to repatriate this gold that they had taken out of the market before Bretton Woods was convened. Uh, some of it was uh, laundered by. BCCI, Chase Manhattan Bank, um, Black Eagle Trust, and a few other of these groups. And, and it was this gold that was laundered illegally from these Asian stashes that financed the, the black ops and the various, you know, uh, secret doings. Um, Right, so this gets back to what you were saying in the 1930s where the Japanese troops were confiscating gold from the Kuomintang. Yeah, and that was taken either to the Philippines or to Japan. At first to Japan, and then when it got too iffy, they, were, they, they transported it over to the Philippines. Now, that wasn't kept in any type of Federal Reserve Bank for those countries. That was in some private storage. It was totally off offline. Yeah, it's a hidden altar. There's about 125 known sites hidden. Um, wow. How much how much tonnage are we talking about here? How much gold was it? What I'm being told is that the story we we've, we've been all told about how all the world all the gold ever mined in history could fit one or two Olympic swimming pools. Uh huh. It's a total lie. Wow. And there's at least uh, nine times or ten times more off market gold than there is officially tradable gold. My God. Um. And and some of it, like I say, was laundered by the CIA types uh, to finance various things. Now, again, I want to I want to take a little side trip here. Uh, what happened with this, one of these Asian secret society groups that I contacted was, mm -hmm. uh, worked in the Golden Triangle during the Vietnam War. And where is that? That's the area between China and Vietnam where they were producing all the heroin in those years. Oh goodness. And they were selling heroin to the CIA, and the CIA was selling heroin to finance their black ops. So they had quite a markup off of the original price they were paying. Well, anyway, it was a, it was yeah. a big business that was out of right. the control of governments, you know. Right. Uh, uh, and what happened was the, the, the Asians contacted their old CIA contacts and said, what the hell are you guys doing? Why are you spreading diseases and trying to start World War III? And a lot of those old CIA black ops types actually came forward and started helping us, which wow. is kind of ironic, but, but still uh, welcome, you know. Well, maybe they're trying to avoid the hangman's noose or something, right? Well, also, I think they, they <laughs> realized that they were being fooled into, you know, by this fake anti-communism, and they didn't like being fooled and used, you know? Yeah, I did speak to one guy who worked in the CIA and actually worked with one of the recent American presidents in cocaine smuggling. And he explained to me in quite some detail the rationale behind why they felt it was necessary to control the flow of cocaine. Mm -hmm. And they have all these rationalizations about, oh, you know, we don't want people to die from bad cocaine. And, and if we can control it, then we plus, know exactly where it's going. Plus, we get these Swiss bank accounts with right. all this money, you know. Right, exactly. Uh, which helps kind of lubricate your conscience a little bit, but still. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway. Um, let, let's get back to the, the main flow. In, so in 1994, the uh, Bretton Woods mandate expired. And right, you said it was a 60-year commission that was started in 1944. Yeah, it was a 50-year commission. 50-year, okay. And before that, they, they, uh, they stole the money from the foreign holdings, the dollar holdings of the Soviet Union. I, I'm sorry, uh, I want to ask you one dumb question, though. Right. You're saying 1944, but it's my understanding 19. World War II didn't end until 1945. Yeah, but but the Bretton Woods Conference was in 1944. They already knew what was going to be the result. So, I see. Okay. Um, that's just, you know, that's open history. Bretton Woods okay. is no big secret. Okay, no problem. Um, so you so, said that the mandate expired in 1994 after 50-year term. 
Yeah, and it wasn't renewed because they said, hey, France and U U.S. and Britain, you didn't modernize the world. You didn't keep your promises. Now, who's not, the they in this case? It would be all the other countries. Remember, there are 200 countries or something that have sovereign rights still. So they would have to ratify the agreement to, to get it to renew. They'd have to sign yeah, and so off. There's on. been no real agreement at the top of the global financial system since then. And so then the only reason why it hasn't changed any faster is they don't have the military muscle to do anything about this. Well, that's what uh, part of it. And, and Clinton, President Clinton, uh, you know, he started. These guys were, were, were thinking the hell with it. We're just going to uh, start World War III and get ourselves out of this mess by killing everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and Clinton started off by allowing um, 100 times leverage, you know, like gambling uh, 100 times. So $1, you could buy $100 worth of tickets. Right. right. Uh, and, you know, if it goes from $100 to $200, then your $1 is multiplied 100-fold. Anyway, it, it's, it, they turned the financial system into extreme gambling. Were they uh, using like, Were they using these confiscated gold accounts from the um, Kuomintang to back that up? Or well, yeah, it was all backed up. They didn't have any legal backing anymore, but but they were going ahead with it anyway. Now, what happened was in 1998, the Chinese they sued the Federal Reserve Board. They said, "Hey, you've got to give us back our gold. You have we have these contracts." You gave we gave you the gold. It was sixty years is up. Give us back the gold. Why would and they have waited four years? Why nineteen ninety eight? That was nineteen thirty eight. Was when the seven ships loads of gold was sent to the United States from China. Oh, okay. There were many shipments, but this is nineteen thirty thirty eight. Seven battleships, U.S. battleships, evacuated Chinese gold from China to the United States to avoid it being taken by the Japanese, and they gave the Chinese all these. Uh, Federal Reserve Board bonds uh, promising to give the gold back in 60 years. Is there any recorded history of that, or is this all... Oh, yeah. Okay. The Chinese have elaborate documentation, which is why this whole lawsuit is taking place. Is any of that documentation public domain, though? Um, Yet. It will, it's all going to be there in that lawsuit, so it's public domain when it goes into the lawsuit, but uh, you know, I've seen lots of pictures. I don't know, you know, I'm not an expert in arcane bonds, but Right, but as a, uh, as a financial journalist, you certainly had contact with economists. Would the average Western economist have known about these shipments in 1938? Yeah, sure. That would have been the headline news. I'm sure if you went back to the newspaper archive, you'd find stories about it. Terrific. Okay, great. Okay, this isn't this is something you could find because you know the the, the just go to an archive. I'm sure you'll find stories about Chinese gold being evacuated. So this was done by the U.S. military to protect the Kuomintang gold from the Japanese army. Yeah. Which was actually the Rothschilds. Well, let's leave that all stuff out for now. Okay. But, okay. you know, <clears throat> the point is that <clears throat> um, in 1998, they sued the, Federal, the Chinese owners of the gold, sued the Federal Reserve Board, and said, give us back our gold. Uh, the Federal Reserve Board people argued that they didn't have to give back the gold because they gave a bunch of gold to Chairman Mao in the 1970s when China renewed relations with, uh, when Japan, or, sorry, when the United States renewed relations with Communist China. But. Could you be more technical than what you said a bunch? I mean, what are we talking here? 200,000 tons? Jeez. I believe. But that's 200,000 tons is, is not going to fill seven battleships. Well, I'm, that's sort of the point. They lost the case. Right. The, the, the International Court of Justice said, you know, you guys uh, have to give back the gold you took. And they said, okay, and the first shipment of gold they're supposed to give back was due to be sent on September 12th, uh, 2001. Jesus Christmas. And, of course, what happened was, as you know, the, there were... The World Trade Center got blown up on December 11th, or in September 11th, and the gold that was in the basement of the f went missing, and Cantor Fitzgerald Securities, the company that was handling the paperwork, was blown up, and all 600 of their employees were killed. Was that in and Building 7? No, this was the World Trade Center building. Oh, okay. And the Building 7, where the, uh, you know, the Treasury Police and, and all these people were, was blown up, and all the paperwork there was blown up. Um... And basically, they said, we're not giving back the gold. So it leads one to reason that 
if charges were placed in the World Trade Center when it was constructed, I believe it was constructed in the 70s, right? No, no, look, they, they, let's just, so, I don't want to, look, there was plenty of evidence, I mean, okay. Uh, you know, Bush's brother, President Bush's brother was in charge of security at the World Trade Center. There was all sorts of construction going on there. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to think with the audience here because we're talking really fast and some of these things are going to make them just go head over heels. They're going to be reeling when they hear this. I mean, you're, you're exposing an absolutely incredible through line that shows more compellingly than any other motive I've ever heard of why specifically did the World Trade Center come down. That there was yeah. this massive gold cache underneath the World Trade Center, and they snuck it out, I guess, by some kind of railroad tracks or something, right? It like was a train? shipped to California, and then I believe to Paraguay. Oh, um, my God. But, but uh, the point is that, okay, what happened So next? China must have known they got rolled. I mean, when they saw the World Trade Center come down, they must have suspected something immediately. Of course they knew. They said these bastards aren't going to pay us back. They're trying to... Um, uh, they're trying to... You know, start World War Three, and, and what happened was Holy instead of, they they quintupled the U.S. military budget with this fake war on terror. You know, right? And, and they got was, this Patriot Act that's like five inches thick of paper that just spontaneously yeah, which is showed identical up. Identical to the Nazi Constitution. Okay. Oh my God. And more to the point is that they they had this, and there's a lot of insiders, you know, um, evidence about this, but they had this plan to start this whole Gog and Magog thing again, and this time the plan involves starting a limited nuclear war between Iran and Israel, okay? And they're going to use that war as an excuse to set up martial law in the G7 countries. What's the time frame you're talking about for when this was being planned now? Well, they've been trying it for quite a long time now, ever since 2001 and even before. Right, so, uh, so just to, to set up the chessboard now, we're post 9-11, the Chinese know that they've been rolled, that this gold has once again been stolen. China yep. wants to get their gold back, and in the meantime, yep. the Rockefeller faction in the U.S. They're building up their military, okay. and they're trying to uh, get the Western countries on a full militarized basis to prepare for World War III. And what's that going to do for them? They want to reduce population, and they want to wipe out the Chinese? And they don't want to lose control. They right. don't want to lose power. And so, they're... Right. They, they, and they had their, they still have their, their messianic, fascist, cultist belief that they're destined to rule humanity. And, and, and so, and the Israeli newspapers even referred openly to, uh, China and Russia and Iran as Magog and the G5 or G7 as Gog. Wow. Um, you know, and, and they were trying to get all these countries to kill each other. Wow. They were trying to start World War III. Their plan, I've seen a map they have, I've, uh, of where they're going to divide China into six countries, you know. Like uh, balkanize it, it, yeah. Post-World uh, War III. Hmm. Um, but what happened was the Pentagon, you know, realized that through their game scenarios that, that if they started all World War III, 90% of humanity would die, including most of them. And so they didn't want to go with it. Hmm. Um and they, they constantly prevented attacks on Iran. They, they stopped Israeli air raids. Uh, they invaded the Georgia to stop an Israeli attack on Iran from there. Mm. They, they didn't want to start World War III because they that realized was the, it was you're, insanity. You're talking about the South Ossetia War now? Yeah. yeah that okay. was an Israeli air base that was designed to attack Iran and start this whole thing. Oh, wow. Okay, so this is, you know, it's truly crazy stuff, but the evidence is right there in front of your eyes. I mean, it's in, like I said, the Israeli newspapers openly talked about it. And Haaretz and places like that. So, um, what happened now, there's a, a, a plot, a, a counterplot was they sent these people to cash a trillion dollars worth of the bonds that were given to them by the feds. So you're saying now that the Asian secret societies who control enough gold that if it were repatriated, it would be thousands of trillions of dollars. That's what it says in the legal document. Yes. They created a sting operation with these guys. Together with the CIA. Together uh, with the CIA, okay. With the like, CIA guys who, who they used to work with in Southeast Asia, right? Who, who don't want the powers that were to still be running the show. Yeah, well, they realize it's, they're insane and incompetent. And, yeah. and uh, you know, they, they're... They were like one level below these guys and knew that they were 
crazy, you know? Yeah, now when we write this up and we have this all transcribed on my website, I'm going to embed videos for people and the original articles on Bloomberg.com that demonstrate the mainstream media to a limited degree, because hardly anybody would touch this story, saying that these guys were detained on the border in Italy, I believe, yeah. with okay. 134 .5 no okay. billion dollars in 1934 bonds, right? Yeah. Okay. Now this is this is very important. There's a couple things you need to learn uh, let, let people realize when they try to create disinformation about this. Okay. Great. Okay. The guys' names I've talked about them. Um, Yamaguchi and Watanabe. Okay. Watanabe. Now, uh, I, I I was involved because I caught called by the uh, P2 Freemason Lodge. I talked to some of the Italian Treasury police who arrested it. First of all, they said that their, the bonds were forgeries, okay, but neither Watanabe nor Yamaguchi were arrested. They were let go. And then the Italians said that there was a trial, um, but there's no record of a trial, okay? Mm. Um, there's no record of these bonds being officially confiscated, but we do have evidence that uh, Prime Minister Berlusconi tried to cash them. And we do have, you know, evidence that Ban Ki-moon, the head of the UN, came forward and said, we'll give you $100 million to go away and forget about this whole thing. Jesus. Um, uh, we have the Davos World Forum. In other words, we can prove that the head of the UN, the UN, the Davos World Forum, and Prime Minister Berlusconi, among others, were involved in this theft. And that is provable case. It's not, you know, they... These people were followed, they were recorded, they were videotaped. Um, this is all provable in a court of law, which is why we went through a lawsuit. Okay, let's get one thing clear, though, and that is that these bonds were generated in 1934 by the Federal Reserve, but in 1934 they made sure that if China ever actually tried to use these bonds, that they would appear fraudulent when they were tried to be cashed. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, there's deliberate typos, and then the the numbers themselves are astronomical. They don't, uh, you got to understand that there's two financial systems in the world, okay? There's like the, the stuff that's on the books, and there, according to the official government statistics, world GDP is $63 trillion, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have these bonds, which are supposedly worse worth 371 trillion dollars you know it, it just um there's a disconnect what bonds are worth 371 trillion the exactly? total amount held by the dragon family the 85 percent of the world's uh gold and treasure that's how much it was assessed at okay so this is the stuff that was blacklisted yeah and, yeah. and the, the the stuff that uh prior Sikar to Bretton Woods nephew gave us power of attorney to, to sue over you know and that power of attorney was given specifically to Neil Keenan, as cited in your document. Yeah, and Keith Scott. Okay. Uh, and, and that's just to, to say, hey, you guys stole gold and treasure that doesn't belong to you. And what, what makes this lawsuit scary to the people who run the financial system is that uh, they have now the legal right to open what's known as a black screen. Hmm. Now, a black screen, I had to, you know, this is esoteric stuff, but basically... You got to remember that 95% of the money in the world exists only as numbers in a computer. <laughs> only 5% of it's in cash money, okay? That's you know, like most people's it's... bank account too, right? Unless you yeah, withdraw I mean, you... the money, it's just in a computer. Yeah, but otherwise what you get is a, 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 a book entry with numbers, you know? Sure. Okay, well these numbers, now these, there's high level codes. That allow you to punch in, like you, 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 you go through the, the, the secret stuff, you punch in your access code and whatever, and then you type in like a billion dollars and bingo, you've created a billion dollars. Now that's a pretty nice little thing to have your hands on, and you can see why these guys don't want to give it up. These uh, guys meaning the Western powers? Not the Western powers, but the, the, the Sabbateans who are above and behind the Western powers. I'm talking about the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, and all these kind of people. So these black screens are part of the same financial system that was created by Bretton Woods. Well, it's uh, it's the current version. It's it's uh, it's the ultimate, you know, 
high tech computer network where the money is all supposedly uh, hidden. The Wouldn't problem there is be because some that entity like the I charge at the top, and there was no agreement. Different groups started creating, you know, ridiculous numbers. I've heard I mean, that there's now quintillions of dollars that they've tried to put into the system. I've heard and that that's as like well. Thirty-three orders of magnitude more than there is real world economy. Okay, so it's broken. The system has mathematically malfunctioned at the highest level. Now, now one of the things that I've heard. This is an important point. Some of the insider stuff I've heard, and I've never said this publicly before, but. It's my understanding that as a result of Bretton Woods, central banks were forbidden from directly trading with one another. They had to have civilian intermediaries who actually were the bond holders who actually kept the equity in their own private accounts. But part of Bretton Woods was that these people were supposed to deposit like 80% of the yield as this money was created out of thin air into humanitarian relief programs. Would you agree with that? I've heard something along those lines, and I know uh, at least a couple of people who do this trading between governments. Right. One of like 20 people at the BIS who are authorized to do this stuff. Right. Talk directly to them. Um, uh, but yeah, the point is that, and here's the, the, the problem, is that if they open these screens and, they, and they have, we have the access codes now, they realize That's that the money wasn't used mostly for humanitarian purposes. It was stolen and used for military industrial purposes. So when you say words, open the black screens, is that the equivalent of what you were calling the Book of Maklumat that came from Suwarto in Indonesia? Well, the Book of Maklumat is one of several, uh, you know, physical account entries that would allow people to open up this can of worms and, and prove that money was stolen. Is there one but, copy of it only, or, or is... No, there are many copies hidden all over the place now, of course, because it's such a sensitive si issue. Wow. You know, we don't want to have... Um, but essentially, but who? I mean, but, who has the jurisdiction to go after these guys? That's one of the problems. That's the problem. We we are in uh, kind of uncharted territory because we don't have the structures right now. The United Nations is run by a bunch of gangsters. Uh, a lot of the world leaders have been bribed and blackmailed into into obeying these people. Okay, so what what's happening is we're entering a kind of a vacuum and we need to set up new structures, new systems, a new way of running the planet. Now, but I if, think if, 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 if the Euro, if the Euro and the dollar become bankrupt, people are going to be really pissed and those changes could happen pretty quickly, right? Well, the Euro is already bankrupt because uh, you can see the IMF, which is supposedly the highest financial body on earth, is saying they don't have any money. <laughs> now that's, I mean, when That's Russia scary. went bankrupt, it was the IMF that bailed them out, and now the so-called IMF doesn't have money. That's wow. because they don't have a legal mandate. It expired in 1944, 1994. Okay? <clears throat> They're just a bunch of people claiming to have the right. No one gave it to them. And that means that these non-aligned nations you're referring to, they're not accepting the bubble money that's being created in the computers anymore? They're not it's accepting all, that equity? Been, yeah, it's all being blacklisted. It's kept out of the system. That's why the dollar hasn't, you haven't had hyperinflation in the United States, is because that money is not being put into the system. Hmm. Otherwise, all these numbers announced by the Fed, if you do the math, you'd say, well, why isn't there hyperinflation? There should be, but there isn't. Um, oh. Because it's not being allowed into the system. So, uh, it is a mess, but here's the real point, okay, is that the creation of money, it's a, in a way, it's a process of deciding what we as a species do in the future, okay? Yeah, yeah. And it's been controlled by religious fanatics who wanted to carry out Old Testament prophecies, which is really wacko, but, but in true, but it's kind of mind-boggling, all right? But most of us ordinary humans... Like any Miss America candidate or pretty well any guy you pick off the street would say, well, uh, end poverty, you know, um, stop environmental destruction, uh, maybe make everyone rich and happy, you know, stuff like that. I mean, it's not uh, rocket science. That What we want in the future is not what the current set of leaders has in mind. Yeah, they I mean, want World War III and, and uh, killing four billion people. Uh, and a rule of elite over a slave population. Well, we don't want that. But 
Right, well, you're, you're actually you... saying that, that, I mean, because we've revealed something in this interview that I've never heard you say publicly before, and that is that the amount of gold that's here, it, it's like all of the confiscating of the Roman Empire that pulled it out of these ancient places where it already was, that it all somehow made its way over to China because of silk trading and, and this and that and opium. A Asia, Asia, Asia. Spice, okay. uh, silk, ceramics. Right. So there's uh, this massive amount of gold that could put us back on a gold standard where where currency is tethered okay. to something of real value. Yeah, the problem with the gold standard is if you talk to the people, and, and the one group that supported us are the people who used to control the gold. Because, you see, as far as they're concerned, the golden rule is he who has the gold makes the rules. Yeah. Well, that's not really a viable alternative to fiat money, if you ask me, okay? True. Um, what, what I personally support is we need multiple different uh, groups that have some kind of planning function, you know, into the future. And whatever they do has to be based on stuff that exists in the real world. There is a discipline in reality that you cannot escape. If you grow wheat, that wheat exists, and then you can put out a receipt saying hey, this is good for wheat. But if you just put out a receipt that's backed by nothing, it doesn't exist. Right. It's just a fact of nature. Right. Um, and what I've supported is I came here when you know back in the eighties when Japan was number one and it was the country of the future. And they had a system which I thought was, was the best we've seen so far on this planet. Now they had what was known as an economic planning agency, and they would draw up an idea of where we want this country to be five years from now, you know, mm. and everybody would be consulted and people would say we want more roads, we want more sewers, we want more schools, uh, we want to have a space station, whatever it was, and then they would draw up detailed plans. The, the Bank of Japan would go around and figure out how much money they could print that was backed by real stuff without causing inflation. And, sure. you know, backed by real stuff it means real estate, uh, gold, rice, anything real. <clears throat> um, and then they would the uh, private industry would actually carry it out. And what they had was they had fast economic growth for decades, very fast, close to ten percent a year. Mm. They had the lowest gap between the poor and the rich in any developed country, and probably any country on earth. Uh, and it was the Americans who came in and bullied them and and forced them to to dismantle that system, which was why they've had stagnation for the past twenty three years. Mm. The Chinese are still using a system similar to the old Japanese system, which is why they still have fast economic growth. Wow, okay. So what I'm saying is that you need some people who are selected because they're very smart, because they pass a good exam, who are given the job of carrying out people's wishes um, in a realistic manner. And so everybody says, this is what we want the world to be in five years. And then these guys try to make it real by, by you know, uh, focusing on numbers and, and, and stuff that can actually be done. Now, I'm not saying we want a single planning agency for the whole planet. I'm saying this could be one of many competing groups trying to create new projects for the future. Sure. The CIA guys and, and these people I talked to and the, uh, the Rothschild faction that's helping us, they want their own new offshore centers where they could carry out their own plans and, and projects for the planet. Hmm. And that's fine. I don't think we want a centralized you know, control network, but we do need to make sure that anything that does exist is disciplined by reality. It has to be based in something real. Like, it, the system should be that if someone takes a log and carves it into a totem pole, they've created money. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You, it, it shouldn't be some guy with a computer, you know, some powerful oligarch with a computer punching in numbers and acting like God, which is what we have now. You know? Sure, sure. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is that if you look at reality right now, the fact of the matter is that the European countries and the United States and Australia, uh, they have been getting more stuff from the rest of the world than they've been giving. That's just a fact. Uh, and that right. Means the only that, export they have really is financial products, which basically yeah. is just bubble money. And, and, uh, and, 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 uh, weapons. You know? Weapons, right. But, but, uh, you know, the United States has the world's best university still. They have a very intelligent, well-educated, hardworking population. 
And they have all this high tech that's being suppressed for so-called national security reasons. Right. So if you, we can get these scumbags out of power in the Federal Reserve Board and free the American people, uh, the potential for a boom such as never been seen before is right there. It's ready. Uh, but first, we have to let the old system collapse. These guys are not going to go quietly into the night. They're threatening war still. They're still trying to attack Iran. Uh, they're still threatening. I've had reports now that they're planting nuclear bombs in the old seabed off the shore of Tokyo to try to create another tsunami here. Jesus. They're up to all sorts of nasty stuff, and we have to stop them. Now, you've said before that one of the enforcement arms that could come into play now that you've driven the wedge with this lawsuit is the Pentagon, the good guys in the Pentagon, could at some point actually do mass arrests at gunpoint of, as you've said, I believe most of the House of Representatives and the Senate, because these guys have private accounts in the Vatican Bank and they've been bribed, right? Yeah. I mean, so you're talking about media heads of major, the top five media companies that have been controlling the media to promote this agenda? Well, these guys you know, are preparing to move on that at some point, right? They, they, that's the problem the is that they're not quite sure what to do next. There's a lot of confusion, okay, because it's sort of like it's one thing to say, all right, let's put these guys in jail, but then they say, well, well, now what? And, and there's no, uh, coherent plan in place for what's next. I mean, Keenan and his people, they have their ideas. Uh, you know, I've got mine. Other people have their own plans. They're all pushing, but we, what, I do believe, though, is that, yes, you need to get the, the out-and-out criminals out of power, okay? Put mm -hmm. them under house arrest. You don't have to put them in jail. Like, most of them, it's one of those systems. It's sort of like, you know, uh, I don't know if you saw the movie Scorpion King, but one of these movies where you come in to the top of the pyramid, you beat the guy in a sword fight, and you show up at the top of the stairs <laughs> with the head in hand, and everybody bows down to you. Right. Oh, you know? And most of these guys... Are, are used to that pyramid system, you know. Right. If you change the top, it's like they automatically go along with the new program and say, well, hey, you know, I was just following the Pharaoh, you know. Right. Um, so it could be a, a system where you don't even have to put anybody in jail. Uh, you just say, okay, we, we're, we're, you know, we've changed plan now. Uh, there's a new, new game plan. And, and instead of being py building pyramids, now you're going to be building universities. Mm. And they'll say, okay, you know, let's go for it. So, uh, but having said that, there are a lot of uh, incompetent gangsters at the highest levels of power who shouldn't be there. Right. They don't know how to run a country, and they don't know how to run a planet, and they don't belong in that job. And I mean Obama, among others. His record proves it, you know? Well, I think he's folded way too many times to the pressure well, groups around him. Okay, he's yeah. a pup. Uh, he, and uh, that's a fact of the matter, you know. But the point is that uh, what we do need is... We need to have, as quick as possible, an open debate. We want to get everybody in on it. We don't want this, you know, at, so that we can say, all right, what are we going to do next? It's one thing to get rid of the old system, but if you don't have anything ready in place, you end up with chaos, you end up with a loss of civilization, you know, you end up with collapse of order, and that's one thing that we all agree we don't want. There's got to be a transition uh, towards a better way of running the planet that's not going to destroy but build, you know? Well, I don't mean to play devil's advocate here, but if, if the Asian secret societies and the non-aligned nations have put this squeeze play where, as of our interview, November 28th, there's stuff in the news saying the euro isn't even going to last 10 days, uh, we don't have a lot of time to make those decisions. Right? Well, I mean, no. because people are going to start suffering when these collapses that you guys apparently have helped to engineer finally happen. Well, unfortunately, because the, the people in power in the United States and Washington and Wall Street uh, and in Europe are being very stubborn, they're, they're sort of acting like Hitler was at the end of World War II. Yeah. I'll let Germany collapse before I move from power. Right. Is that there is going to be a really tough winter in the United States and Europe as things stand now, because these guys are not going peacefully and quietly into the night. They're not accepting that there is an, we need a fundamental change in how we run this planet. Um, and 
that is why it's going to be a tough winter unless you hurry up and get these guys out. Well, and they're going to have incredibly powerful disinformation campaigns that will do everything they can to make you appear to be a fool and yeah, that everything you're saying is a lie. Sure. And that if this group actually succeeds, that it's the New World Order and it's the Illuminati and it's fascism and martial law and FEMA camps and all the stuff that they've been trying to get people afraid of. So how do you counter that? Well, the reality of the situation is stronger than the propaganda, okay? Right. I mean, uh, they can talk all they want. It's like they say, well, now I've got a quadrillion dollars, a quintillion dollars. <laughs> see, it's in my computer. All right, go try to spend it. See what happens. You know, right. see how far you get with that. When when uh, Bush, you know, Bush was trying to flee to Paraguay and they stopped him. OK, and then let's see what happens when he takes his black card or whatever they have and, and goes to the store and they say, sorry, can't buy anything. These guys will be just street trash once their once their uh, money is frozen and it's being frozen. Well, now you had said before, I mean, right now you're saying there isn't really a consensus with the Pentagon in terms of when or if to do these so-called mass arrests. I don't know. Look, what I do know is that the Pentagon people always told me they're waiting for this lawsuit to be a trigger. Okay. Okay. And now there's a lot of, okay, well, it's, it's there. We understand that um, the system is rotten and broken, but we're not quite sure what to do next. And there's a lot of behind the scenes negotiating and talking and running around. Uh, and as things stand, the unfortunately, it looks like things are going to have to get more chaotic before these people's minds are concentrated enough that they're ready to start building new uh, systems, new uh, agreements to share this planet. Right. But the, the basic one, the basic one that I have said is a operating principle is that Western and Asian civilization need to start out with an exactly fifty-fifty deal that underlines whatever it is we start building on top of the, you know, the old system. Hmm. Uh, we don't want suddenly, you know, uh, Europeans and Americans to be taking orders from Asians, and the Asians are tired of having Europeans tell them what to do. We need to have a forum where we reach a consensus. We both agree, yes, that's a good idea. Uh, build a well, space car. Okay, good idea. Let's, move, what, let's do it. What side would all the Islamic countries be in that 50-50? Uh, the Islamic countries are, are basically with us except for a few colonies that are still, you know, controlled by the, the cultists pretending to be Muslims. Okay. Um, okay. That, that's, but essentially, you know, they're just afraid of ending up the way Gaddafi did. And so they're keeping their heads low, but, you right. know, they're essentially with us. Okay. Um, and what we really need to do now is to get the Jewish people to realize that their leaders, uh, a lot of them, were part of an insane cult. And that they shouldn't allow those people to speak for them as a people. You know, because these are the same sure. people behind the Holocaust, you know? Right. It's a great. It's The atrocity is too boggling for most people's mind to even wrap around. Exactly. That's what they were counting on. It's just too big for people to wrap their minds around. Now, but all I, this is provable, you know? Right. And, and I think that one thing that I want to make sure we cover before we would end this interview is this presentation now of this legal document, which uh, the, the law firm that's listed on the document is Bleakley, Platt, and Schmidt, LLP, in White Plains, New York. The principal attorney behind it is William H. Mulligan, Jr., I've been to their website. They are definitely a very bona fide legal firm. I haven't actually called them yet, but I, I plan on calling Mulligan and asking him just to verify that this suit is real. But I mean, it's, an, it's a hyper complex document. It's loaded with numbers, documentation, with names. And I'm still on the receiving end of tons of hateful comments that people make towards you. And I would hope that this document will do a lot to allay those concerns because it is it is very comprehensive. Yeah, well, look, this is just, I mean, that, that group, you got to remember, that's, that's the, uh, the people behind that lawsuit are, are an important group within the West that support, you know, the, the move to more 
towards a more sane international financial system. But they're not the only group out there. A lot of people know that something's wrong and something new needs to be done. But what, what, like I say, it's a situation right now. My understanding is that uh, chaos is the best word to describe what's happening now within the leadership circles of the Western world. Mm. And I would even include Japan in that. Okay, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, people don't know what to do next. And it's important to have a lot of open debate and truth disclosure so that people can make informed decisions. I don't think this should be handled behind closed doors anymore. I think it should be open to the public. Right, and, and regardless of this... But yeah, I mean... Uh, Go ahead. Uh, but, you know, if people have specific things where they think I am either wrong or crazy, I'm happy to answer it. I don't, you know, uh, there's no point responding to slander, but if there's real arguments there, I'd be happy to listen to them, you know? Well, at, when I did my due diligence on the document, the biggest concern of mine, which I published on your forum, was that in Section 33 of the document, there is a series of eight sentences regarding the World Economic Forum. And then I said, when I was concerned about whether the document was legitimate, I, I looked up World Economic Forum on Wikipedia, yeah, and, well, and the sentences on Wikipedia were almost exactly the same as what's in well, the legal sure. document. Sure, the guy writing the legal document says, all right, they, we know that it was a Davos World Economic Forum because there was a, uh, a tape recording of a conversation with uh, Giancarlo Bruno, who's the head of financial services at the World Economic Forum. Okay. Okay? So we have evidence, forensic evidence, that they're linked. And you but can then present okay, that, yeah. So what's the World Economic Forum anyway? And the lawyer goes to Wikipedia and, and, and uh, cuts and pastes eight sentences. Okay. Yeah, you know, sure. I mean, that's what people do. I mean, right. even and lawyers writing up legal documents. The, the, the other mistake that I made publicly that I want to correct to your credit Mm -hmm. was that uh, in the document, the Office of International Treasury Control is referred to. I didn't read the document carefully enough when I wrote my comments to see that in the legal document, the legitimacy of this OITC and its alleged UN charter is challenged. In other words, they attack the OITC, but I think the... because when Before I get to that, when you look at the OITC website, it is painfully amateur... It made me have to reload my browser in 32-bit mode. The videos were done on PowerPoint. There's lots of grammatical errors on the website. It's a joke. Yeah, it's a joke. And uh, guy R.C. Dam, who they put up as a guy who supposedly was in charge, is uh -huh. some guy who's a uh, Cambodian guy. He's on, by the way, he's on the run now. He, he's fled. The people don't know where he is. Um, right, and the, and the really crazy... Of CIA, he was just a front man, to, you know... Yeah, and, and the really crazy part, too, if you, if you actually look up OITC, Office of International Treasury Control, on Wikipedia, you, you read about this massive fraud that these guys posing as the OITC, which allegedly is where the equity yeah. of the world's banks is being kept, po po instilled a fraud on Fiji and said they yeah. were going to finance Fiji in the billions of dollars, which, of course, didn't come to pass. That's right. And so... I, any conventional con man, I mean, you'd have to have really brass balls to try to defraud an entire country. Well, they realize, you see, these guys probably realize that the people who actually control the the financial system themselves were based on fraud, and so they're trying to get a piece of the action. Right. That's my reading of it. But what I do want to emphasize is that, you know, even though Keenan and Scott have power of attorney right now, they shouldn't be put in charge of the planet all of a sudden. You know, we need an open discussion involving lots of people. Uh, and that discussion is going to take place at the forum of 117 nations, the Monaco Accords, who have agreed to set up a new financial system. And we need to get the G5 nations and their satellite countries to participate in these discussions so we can as quickly as possible come up with new global structures to replace the corrupt and rotten UN, World Bank, BIS, and IMF with something more representative of the people on Earth. And I don't mean a global government. I mean right. a common set of rules for the planet and we all share, the air we all breathe, the oceans we all use. Not some centralized 
New World Order control grid. All right? Absolutely. Now, is the Malaysian War Crimes Tribunal that found Bush and Blair guilty of war crimes, is that in any way related to this 117 Nation Alliance? It's just, it's, it's just another, no, it's just another okay. sign that humanity is waking up and they're tired of being controlled by this criminal cabal, but that no consensus has been come up with with what to do next. However, I can say this. There is a lot of support for my idea of a new international economic planning agency to do things like turn the deserts green and replenish the oceans with fish and stop environmental destruction, but not as a world government, but simply as some group that carries out big, large-term, uh, long-term and large-scale projects for the benefit of the people and the living organisms of this planet. Yeah, and I think that a lot of the people in these groups, they don't want to be working for the bad guy. They want to yeah, save face. Exactly. And they, they want to save the planet. So yeah. let's do it. This is the goal, but thanks for talking to me. No, I really appreciate it, Ben. This has been a great interview, and uh, uh, my prayers are, and support are with you guys. And um, there was one other thing I just want to toss in briefly yep. about the Office of International Treasury Control, and that is that I made a misstatement publicly. When I went back and read your document, the document clearly states that this was a fraudulent organization, but that the UN is at fault because they allowed this organization to continue to prosper without ever publicly refuting yeah, well, their alleged charter. Ban Ki-moon himself, the head of the UN, is using fraudulent documents as we talk to try to take over African countries, just like they're using the same fraudulent documents to try to take over Europe. My God. Okay. Now he's citing seven families as his authority, and the seven families, of course, are the seven families that founded the Federal Reserve Board. Oh my and they God. have no authority. They're a bunch of crooks and gangsters, and we need to kick the bums out. All right? Thank you very much, Ben. And I don't want to end on a, a, a bad note. What we really need to do is end poverty, stop environmental destruction, and create a wonderful new future for the planet and the species on it. Well, we're all behind you, and we look forward to the next update. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you ben. very much. All right. Take care. Okay, this is David Wilcock, and after finishing my interview with Benjamin Fulford last night, I wanted to do my due diligence on this whole story. It's an amazing story. I know that many people have trouble believing in a story of this scope. I know that many people have trouble believing in Benjamin Fulford, even though as we just established in this interview, he has impeccable credentials. He's met with prime ministers. He's met with many of the top people in Asian government, military, etc. All that being said, the proof in the pudding is in the eating. And if this lawsuit has been filed, then there are going to be telephone numbers on it, including the names of the law firms involved and so forth. So... What happened is I decided to take a risk in making this jump to actually try to find out if, in fact, this attorney, William Mulligan, and the firm that he claimed to represent, Bleakley, Platt, and Schmidt, was real. What happened was I picked up the phone and looked him up on the Internet, and there was a direct line that they gave. When I spoke to him on the phone... Obviously, I could hear his voice. He knew who I was. First thing that happens, I, p I pick up the phone, I call him, and he says, oh, you're David Wilcock. I'm like, uh-oh. Uh, but I didn't know if, if this was fake. And I was going to explain myself and introduce myself, and he, he kind of cut me off. And then he says, um, I, I said, well, would you be willing to talk later? And he said, perhaps. And it was a very stern perhaps. And then... That was it. So now I had the voice. I didn't know if it was real or not. I sent him an email in which I said, look, if this is not real and you're being harassed and people are calling you, please let me know. I will nuke the story. I will go out there on my website and represent this as a fraud. Please let me know. Immediately after I sent that email on my browser through this little pop-up window that lets you send it right to him on the Bleakley, Platt, and Schmidt legal website, I go back to my inbox. There's a brand new email that wasn't there but 30 seconds earlier before I, it, well, I had checked all my email right before I wrote the letter. I go back and I have a letter from an old-time friend and acquaintance, Kimberly Yeager, who's on with me right now. 
And Kimberly, your part of the story fascinates me because you send me an MP3 file that has the voice of the exact same guy I just was speaking to. And why don't you tell me yourself what happened from there? Okay, so what happened is that I've been following this story very carefully, and my husband is an attorney, so we immediately on Thanksgiving went to pacer.gov to look for the case. Right. Um, but have since realized that it takes days for it to post. Right. But continued checking Pacer every day um, for the last couple of days, and this morning I asked him to check again, and he's the one who sent me the contact information of the firm. Okay. And so, essentially, I called, <laughs> and I received, I left a voicemail, and then I also sent an email, and within minutes, William Mulligan called me back. Um, I have the caller ID on my phone uh, from the same number, Wow! and he made the statement that you have the clip of that you can use. Um, we'll post it in right now. So for the listeners who are listening, uh, here we go. We'll roll the clip. Thank you, Mr. Mulligan. So if you would just answer my question, we would all appreciate that. Thank you. William Hughes Mulligan, Jr. I'm a member of the firm of Blakely, Platt & Schmidt, and yes, we filed the complaint on November 23rd uh, representing Neil Keenan, index number 11 Civ 8500. All right. Thank you okay, very dope. much. All Thank right. You. Have a great day. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, great. So he definitely confirms that this is a civil complaint that was filed through his firm and that the whole story is true. Uh, this is absolutely astonishing, utterly groundbreaking, world-changing information. This is probably the biggest scoop for a journalist covering this New World Order Illuminati story ever. I mean, what could possibly be bigger than this? This is unprecedented. Well, that's how I felt about it, and so I continued to follow it and got my own personal confirmation, and I also wanted to tell you that I did talk to him. I just hadn't made that statement. That's all I wanted. But I did ask him about the pacer.gov because we were all curious about that, and he said that he had checked, and the most recent case that has been filed was of November 22nd. He's not seeing anything later than that. And he said, you can probably go to the courthouse and get a copy right there. So if there's anybody in New York, <laughs> they can go to the court and ask for a copy. Well, some people are going to cringe for me saying this, but I'm looking at the clock right now, and it's 11-11. Nah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, you can't deny the synchronicity. It was instantaneous after I sent this guy the letter that I clicked <laughs> back to my inbox, and you sent me the proof. And now I had just heard his voice, and so it's definitely the same guy. Right. Uh, is there a reason why he was so quick to end that statement? Was he wanting to not talk to you very much and reluctant, or, or how did you feel about that? Oh, no, that? no, 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 he was, no, we talked a bit before that, and then I asked permission to record that statement. Okay. So I, I asked him permission if I could record it, because that was really all I wanted. I just wanted the proof that the case had been filed <laughs> and that he had filed it, and I didn't ask him any further questions than that. That was all I wanted to know. Well, obviously, one of the things that somebody should ask him is, are you suicidal? Because, you know, there's these kind of guys have an unfortunate habit of suddenly deciding to want to kill themselves. Well, I don't know anything about that, but he sounded, you know, he sounded very calm and cool and collected no, I, and had no problem I'm being <laughs> facetious. I, I, I'm being facetious. I mean, the all the paranoid <laughs> conspiracy tinfoil hat guys out there are immediately going to say, well, if this is true, then this guy's going to get suicided. How could they possibly let him live? That's going to be the skeptical argument is, even though this guy's a real law firm, and even though I heard his voice and you heard his voice, and we're obviously not colluding on this, this all has happened spontaneously, and I just called you, uh, people are still going to think that, well, if it's true, then it still can't be true because the New World Order guys would have already killed him and they never would have allowed this to happen. What do you think about that? Well, I don't think that the attorney has anything to do with it. He's just doing his job. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, so, yeah. Yeah. So he's just doing his job, and uh, and obviously he felt um, that he was willing to put his name on it. So, Did he give um, you any other particulars about the case itself? Uh, what was the substance no, of the rest of your conversation? I, like I said, I okay. really only wanted to know if it had truly been filed, and I wanted the proof, and that was the best proof I could get. Okay. 
Yeah. Well, Kimberly, I thank you for making this statement and. Uh...